Hello. Uh, so uh, we continue our study of the irregularity of weak solutions to divergence form elliptic PDEs today. So uh, we are going to skip uh, the C1 alpha regularity via perturbation methods and instead uh, move on to uh, iteration methods, uh, which was um, discovered by uh, De Georgi, uh, Nash, and uh, Moser in the late 50s and early 60s, I think. And in fact, um, the things that we're going to, the, uh, the things that we're going to look at uh, at this point, are the things that led to the solution of Hilbert's 19th problem uh, 50, 50 or so years after uh, he posted them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a quick recall. Um, we have proven that if you use a weak solution to this divergence form elliptic PDE, and if we have that A has some continuity properties, wait, I think I'm missing something. I think we, we can, we, can say something more fact, I'm sorry, plus Cu equals F, okay. So we have a lower order term. So if we have a weak solution to uh, this equation, and we know that, uh, or we have shown that if A has continuity properties, and A, uh, A has some ellipticity condition, and also we have conditions on C and F, of course, then we have that U is in C alpha. Uh -huh. And that's that's a good thing. That's a leg up because a priori you only know that u is in h one, and now we're saying that it's not just in h one. It's actually going to be continuous, and not just continuous. C alpha continuous, and the idea was uh, to use perturbation methods where we sort of compare u with uh, solutions w to constant coefficient equations. Uh -huh. So the idea here is is that if we're close to x0, then we can sort of estimate um, u by how close is it to w. Uh -huh. And uh, we know that uh, w being a solution to a constant coefficient a PDE uh, has very good regularity. So the idea here is, uh, can we borrow that regularity from w? Uh -huh. Okay, so it's called perturbation because we are sort of comparing things to, uh, and we are sort of in a small neighborhood of like some point. Okay, so what we're going to, what we're going to look at today is another way of obtaining uh, C alpha regularity, but without these perturbation arguments. So, um, uh, they are what you call like iteration methods because as you can as you will see in the proof you have this some sort of like iteration scheme going on so before we um, talk more about uh, the idea of the proof let's present the result first so the big result actually is not uh, the uh, C alpha uh, reg uh, regularity it's the boundedness. The boundedness is the difficult part to prove. So what it says is, so we have here local boundedness. So suppose you have that the coefficients are in L infinity V1. Note that uh, since it's in L infinity, we're already assuming that it's measurable. So we have measurable bounded coefficients. C is in LQ for Q bigger than N over 2. And suppose that uh, the matrix A, so A is com uh consists of these coefficients a i j so suppose that it satisfies an ellipticity condition okay so we know, already know what this means okay so suppose that this is true for any x in b1 and lambda positive and suppose we have a condition on how big a and c are by this uh -huh. so l infinity norm of a plus lq norm of c is bounded by some a positive constant lambda. Uh -huh. Then, okay, so let's look at subsolutions uh, u. So uh, when we say subsolution, what we mean is in the following sense. So if you have integral of a grad u dot grad phi plus cu phi less than or equal to integral of f phi uh, over b1. And this is not for all test functions. Uh, it's only for uh, test functions phi that are non-negative in B1 and in H10. Uh -huh. 
So uh, later world, uh, th there are actually similar notions for like a super solution. And in fact, a weak solution is both a sub solution and a super solution. So a super solution is just going to be the opposite direction. So if this is this, you have that U is a super solution. Super solution. And if U is both a sub solution and a super solution, it's a weak solution. Okay, so uh, so the result that we have here is for sub-solutions, but um, again, uh, a, a weak solution is going to be a super-solution and a sub-solution. So once you can prove this result for sub-solutions, it would like apply to weak solutions. Okay, so the result is... If you have that f is in LQ, Q is bigger than n over 2, then the positive part of U, uh -huh, the positive part, it's just the part of U that is above 0, is in, in uh, L infinity log of B1. So what, that, what it means is that for any subset of B1 that has positive measure, uh, it's L infinity there. Moreover, so we can make this more precise, uh, how we have a quantitative uh, description of this. For any theta in zero one p positive, we have the following. So, uh, the soup of the positive part in b theta is bounded by some constant dependent on just uh, these like constants here times this one. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So note that this is a local result in the sense that you don't get an estimate for the whole of p one, and in fact. Look at this one. So as theta goes to 1, this would blow up. So you lose control on uh, the supremum of u plus uh, as theta goes to 1. It's hence the term uh, local solution. Okay. Okay. So it's not exactly a C alpha result. But as I like mentioned earlier, this is the difficult part. Uh -huh. This is where you use the iteration showing that the solutions are rounded. So what is the general idea for it? So let me try and sketch it. Okay. So the general idea is okay, let's draw some axis. And suppose that this is um, u. Okay, suppose that is u. Mm -hmm. We sort of look at the parts where, say, u is above um, some k and u is above some positive constant h and here so r r big r and they're both less than one oops um, okay uh, these are less than one okay so the idea is this. Okay, so let's highlight the parts. Let's use blue first. Let's highlight the parts that are inside minus R and R that is above H. So what are those? It's going to be this one here. Mm -hmm. And now let's highlight the parts that are bigger than K but inside minus r to r. So what is that? Bigger than k. So it's going to be this. Oops, sorry. So this is included. So bigger than k. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is not exactly blue anymore. It's like purple. Anyway, so the idea is you compare the L2 norm uh, in the pink, no, in the blue region, blue, but now in the graph it kind of looks like purple because it's, um, it's both blue and pink. So in the blue region, and in this part, you have that U is big or large in a narrow set. Narrow set, narrow in the sense that little r is small. And you sort of compare it with the L2 norm in the pink region. 
and in this region u can be smaller oops wrong spelling smaller in a wider set Now, making this precise uh, through the use of estimates, uh, this would actually lead to the iteration scheme. So this, oops, I want this color. So this would lead to an iteration scheme where you would have like uh, a sequence of R sub J's that are that are monotone and some k sub j's that are also monotone so there's going to be some kind of uh, a technical argument where uh, it's going to be an iteration of some sort so it kind of feels like a cascade well, we're going to see later but because of this iteration scheme one can show the existence of a large k such that uh, so for the proof today we're going to see that um, the measure, or you know, let's just say that u is going to be less than or equal to k almost everywhere in b1 half. So this is really the idea. Uh, we're sort of controlling the parts where u can be big. Uh -huh. And we're saying that you cannot uh, be big um, at the large like proportion of the domain, sort of something like that. And in fact, we're going to find that um, past a certain uh, certain threshold, uh, u is going to be uh, actually less than or equal to that threshold almost everywhere in some set contained in b1. And that set is b1 half. Okay. So um, there are, I think, um, three ways of attacking this. So in the book that I'm using, which is Han and Lin's book on second order um, uh, elliptic PDEs, um, they presented uh, the Georgie and Moser's approach. I think Nash has a different approach. What he saw was, I think, the parabolic problem almost uh, independently and almost at the same time as the Georgie in the late 50s. Moser sort of simplified the Georgie's argument and presented his like version of the iteration. Okay. So for today, what we'll be looking at is the Georgie's approach. Um, excuse me. I was actually like um, skimming through Moser's approach as well, and I've seen it before, and have seen it uh, applied in different uh, settings. But I kind of like the Georgie's approach better. It it just feels like more natural to me. So we'll see. We'll see if we're gonna look into Moser's approach. Depends on my mood. So okay. So let's start. So what do we do? So proof. So we, for today, we consider the case where theta is one half and p is equal to two. So method one, the Georgie's approach. And in fact, the, I think the, the, the picture that I've shown earlier that uh, fits um, uh, the Georgie's way. So Moser is sort of a bit different and uh, yeah, maybe maybe we can look at uh, into that some other time. But for now, we focus on the Georgie. Okay, I'm gonna try and make my handwriting nice. Okay. Okay. So we let v be u minus k positive part for k positive. So. What is this? This is just equal to u minus k in parts where um, u is bigger than k and 0 otherwise. Okay, so what is happening here? Uh, graphically, so you sort of have something like this. Suppose this is u. And suppose this is k. So we're just considering parts bigger than k. So it's going to be uh, that. And then shifting it by k. Aha, uh -huh, so shifting it by k. Okay. So it's as if we're just considering the parts that are bigger than k. And um, 
you might be wondering like okay like why do that but this sort of aligns with the idea that we presented earlier that we're comparing uh regions where you would be big and you will be kind of small and stuff like that so you will see later on that um, defining v to be this way is actually going to be very natural to the method okay so we have this v here okay and then let uh i should have is this zeta wait oh, wait a minute what Greek letter is this? Uh, zeta. Yeah. That's zeta? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think this is zeta. Okay, so let zeta be a test function. <laughs> so it's in C10, B1. Uh huh. And in fact, this is going to be what we call a cutoff function. And we're going to uh, talk about later like what other properties do we want from zeta. So this is not the test function that we're going to use. Uh, similar to, be, uh, to the previous video where we want to find estimates, the test function is going to be, um, it would involve the solution. But for this one, it's going to be a bit more sophisticated. I think in the previous one, we set the test function, the test function to be the solution itself. For this one, we're going to set the test function to be V times zeta squared. I'm not sure if... I'm not uh, sure if I'm drawing it as zeta or x z. Like, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's zeta. Okay, so we're gonna set this to be our test function, and note that this is in h one zero of b one. Why is that? Um, because uh, zeta here has compact support. Uh -huh, so that it would be zero, the trace would then be zero on the boundary of V1. And note that this is also non negative because zeta is squared, and V, uh, by definition, this is uh, non negative. So we can use this as a suitable test function uh, in the definition of U being a subsolution. Okay, so remember, recall that uh, for subsolutions, it's not just like every test function, we need some kind of special thing, it has to be non negative. And in H10. Okay. So, uh, similar to what we've seen before, we're going to use phi as a test function in, in that definition. Okay, but before we proceed, let's just make some remarks, some observations. So, note that the first one in the set where u is bigger than k, you have that v is equal to u minus k. And that grad V is just grad U almost everywhere. Okay? And uh, in the complement of that part, you have that V is equal to zero, and that grad V is equal to zero almost everywhere. Okay, there's some observations. Okay, so what are we gonna do? So we're going to substitute now in star. And that would give us integral over, so, uh, okay, let's, let's write it over B1 first. So we have A grad U dot grad phi, so phi is V X Z, uh, zeta squared, plus C U V zeta squared, less than or equal to B1 F uh, V zeta squared. Okay, now note that, um, v is going to be zero outside um, the set where u is bigger than k. So in fact, we these integrals are going to be integrals over the support of v, which is u bigger than k. Okay? Similar to here. Okay. So what do we do now? Okay, so we've seen um, in the previous video, like, what is the natural way to do estimates? So we're going to apply the same things here. So let's first start with, um, what do I want to do? Let's first start with, let's use orange. Okay, this one here. Okay, 
Okay, so if I carry out the, um, if I compute uh, this gradient here, I have, oh, oops, u greater than k of a grad u dot, I have, um, what is this? Zeta squared grad V plus 2V zeta grad zeta, okay? So this is equal now to, so remember that in u bigger than k, grad u is equal to grad V. So I have a grad, ah, sorry. I have zeta squared a grad V dot grad V, okay? Plus 2V uh, zeta, of uh, a grad v dot grad zeta, okay? And now, so we use now ellipticity. So by ellipticity, I can estimate this term. So this is gonna be uh, greater than or equal to, uh, I have lambda zeta squared uh, grad v squared over u greater than k, uh-huh. And to estimate this term, uh, we choose the worst possible bound, which is going to be my negative 2, v is not negative. I have here absolute value of zeta. Um, using boundedness of A, I can bound this by lambda norm this zeta. Okay, so this just came from you have that absolute value, uh, the magnitude of a grad v dot grad zeta is less than or equal to big lambda magnitude grad v magnitude grad zeta, okay? So let's erase that. Now we're going to do the trick, uh -huh, because what, what do we observe here? This has zeta and grad v terms, and we have that uh, zeta and grad v. So we're going to use the trick of, of like Cauchy's inequality with epsilon in order to combine that with this. Uh -huh. So uh, I am going to group. So this is equal to negative. Uh, let's group uh, absolute zeta magnitude grad v and the other thing. So you have to uh, V lambda uh, grad zeta. Let's write it as 2 lambda V grad zeta. Okay, so this is going to be greater than or equal to uh, minus lambda over 2 times the square of this plus some, uh, um, sorry, minus some constant dependent on like little lambda and big lambda that uh, will, uh, can be big times uh, v squared grad v squared. Uh -huh. So the reason that we're doing this is so that we can combine this term and this term and still have something that is uh, positive. So eventually we'll have greater than or equal to Lambda over 2, u greater than k of, of what? Um, let's write it as grad v squared, uh, zeta squared, minus some constant dependent on lambda and big lambda, u greater than k, I have v squared, grad zeta squared. Uh -huh. So all of these are um, straightforward. Okay, so, and we, we've sort of seen this uh, before, uh -huh. so this is like the standard way of uh, estimating the diffusion term, okay. Now, what we're going to do now is move this lower order term to the right and then make some estimates. So doing that, we work with the term, um, let's use, hmm. Integral over u greater than k of f of f zeta squared. So it's now going to be minus c u 
v zeta squared uh, u greater than k. Okay, so how are we going to estimate this? So, let's see. Let's use, I think this is teal. Okay, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write uh, u in terms of v. Okay, so in this set, I know that this is, uh, let's include the negative. So this is equal to negative uh, u greater than k of c, uh, u is equal to uh, v plus k. And I have here v zeta squared. Uh -huh. So this is, uh, it's, it's fairly like uh, standard to show that this is less than or equal to absolute value of c times uh, v squared plus k squared, uh, we can put some constant there, times zeta squared, u greater than k. So eventually, what we have is that the estimate for this is less than or equal to, you have the f term, f v zeta squared, u bigger than k, uh, plus some constant c times uh, c, uh, v squared zeta squared u bigger than k plus k squared c u bigger than k c zeta squared. So very straightforward. Uh -huh. Nothing fancy going on here. So summarizing the results, what we have is, so we combine the estimate that we have here. We move this here and we've estimated that. So Combining uh, the results that we have so far, we have the following. So thus we have So uh, u bigger than k, I have here grad v squared uh, zeta squared less than or equal to some constant. So we just uh, choose the largest constant and we have u greater than k, v squared, grad zeta squared. So where did this term come from? It comes, it came from the estimate on the diffusion term. It's this one here, okay? Plus the other terms. So and what are those? I have u greater than k, uh, c, uh, v squared, zeta squared, plus k squared, u greater than k, of c zeta squared, do I have space? So let's put it here, plus u greater than k of f. Uh, let's make it that, okay. v zeta squared, okay. And I think this is what you call a Cacciopoli estimate. I think, okay, I always spell it wrong. I think it's 2p, Cacciopoli estimate. And what it sort of says is that um, you can estimate the gradient with the L2 norm of V. Uh -huh. Because note that, for example, from Poincaré's inequality, you can estimate the, norm, uh, the L2 norm of V or like the L2 norm of the deviation from its average by the gradient. So here it's sort of like the reverse direction where you have that the, you can control the gradient by the function itself. And note that that's not true for any functions. It's true for solutions to like elliptic PDEs. So Poincaré inequality is true for any like H10 function or H1 function. And if now you have a solution, you can say something uh, stronger where you have like the reverse thing. Okay. So, okay. So what do we do now? So what we do is, uh, okay, so let's see. Let's, we are going to like focus on this one. So note that. Okay, so what do I want to do? Um, this has V and X Z term. So I was sort of wondering whether it would be possible to just have a single gradient term. So it's like grad of V zeta. So let's see. If we compute that, so grad of v zeta, what is this? This is equal to um, zeta grad v plus v grad zeta. Uh -huh. So that the magnitude of grad zeta okay, squared is less than or equal to some constant 
times grad v squared zeta squared plus v squared grad zeta squared. Uh -huh. Okay, so that we now have an estimate on grad v zeta squared. Uh -huh. So this is going to be bounded by a constant times this plus this. So we can estimate this and how it's exactly this one. How about the other term? Well, the other term appears in the estimate for this term. What is that term? It's v squared grad zeta squared. So we actually have this just less than or equal to some constant times the same thing. Okay. Can I just copy that? Let's just copy that times the same thing. Copy. Oh, oops. Okay. Okay. So we have this estimate so far. And note that a lot of uh, the calculations are fairly uh, straightforward. Okay, so now what we're going to do next is to, um, let me just see, I'm thinking if I should break apart the video. Okay, let's stop here. Uh -huh. Then uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to try and uh, work more with these estimates. Um, so eventually, remember, uh, the idea of the proof is to compare uh, L2 solutions in where places where you can be large as compared to where it can be like uh, smaller but in, over a wider region. Uh -huh. But so far, we don't have L, uh, we don't have L2. We have here uh, a gradient sort of thing. So there's still some work to do here, and we still have like these test functions zeta. So uh, that's gonna be the point of the next video. Uh huh. Like uh, so what do you do from here? Okay. So excuse me. So yes. Uh huh. So that's it for now.